Greetings and welcome. We are in Junior English, and uh, we're now going to spend just a few moments with Ralph Waldo Emerson's poem, Concord Hymn, on page 371. We want to uh, say a couple of things for your annotations before we actually get to the text itself. The first thing that we want to point out is that any time you're looking at a text, you always want to pay attention to the title. And so let's go ahead and make sure you have the title written down, and let's see if on your own you can quickly define the two words of this title. Do you have any kind of background knowledge of any type? Let's begin with the second word, hymn. So, for example, if you know what that word means, write it down real quickly. What is a hymn? Okay, what do we mean when we use the term hymn? All right, well, we're talking normally, a hymn is normally a song, all right, a song. But normally the word hymn is going to be referenced to a sacred song. That is to say, a song of importance that would be understood maybe even in a religious setting, okay? So that's what we mean when we use the, the word hymn in this way, all right? Now, let's get to this issue of concord. Now, what exactly do, you, do we mean by concord? Well, concord is a small town outside of the larger city of Boston, okay? A small town outside the larger city of Boston. All right, so that's our so that's our understanding. Okay, so what is significant in regards to the history of this text? Well, let's talk about it for a few moments. All right, first of all, let's point out in this poem, Emerson is going to bring together two of his favorite ideas. One, the idea of nature and the power and the force of nature. Two. The idea of country, that America is a special place, okay? By 1800, Emerson is already making this argument that America is different from any other nation in the world, okay? And the source of a lot of the patriotism that will happen later is going to begin here with writers like Emerson and, of course, Whitman. Now, in this poem... He's also going to be celebrating courage. You want to write that down. Or bravery. All right? Courage or bravery. Bravery by whom? Well, a special term. They're called the minute men. The minute men. Now, who are the minute men? Well, these are what we're going to call militia. In other words, when all of the history transpires, this poem is going to celebrate. You have farmers working in fields who then pick up their rifles and come to the aid of their communities. They do it in a fast time and therefore are known as the Minute Men, fighting against the British in what will later be called, of course, the American Revolutionary War. All right? So we're talking about a very particular time in American history. Okay? Finally, this poem is going to talk about memorial. Now, what does that mean? memorial, <clears throat> to be remembered. In other words, you do something for which you are remembered after you die. Okay? You'll remember that Longfellow says in Psalm of Life, lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind his footprints on the sands of time. You'll remember footprints that perhaps another sailing on life saw a man of forlorn and shipwrecked brother seeing shall take heart again. In other words, you can do things that once you're gone, people will remember you for those things. Emerson is going to make that argument in this poem. Now let's get the history out of the way real quickly. First of all, if you'll look in the lower right corner of 371, you will see a statue there made, all right, to commemorate the Minutemen. There's two things I want to point out about that statue. You will want to write them down in your notes as well. Notice there's something in both of his hands. Do you see that? Now in one of his hands, that's fairly simple to see. He's got a rifle, doesn't he? Right? So we want to put that down. He's got a rifle, which signifies, of course, his willingness to shoot. But what's in the other hand? Can you, can you take a look and see what that is? Well, believe it or not, that is a plow. A plow. Now, what's up with the plow? Well, we're going to commemorate that these Minutemen were first and foremost farmers who wanted to just plow the land. And then secondly, 
They were fighters. That is to say, they shot those rifles. Okay. Now, your important date here, let's write it down for this poem. April 1775. April 1775. All right. There's a British military force that's going to march to confiscate certain kind of arms that they knew were stockpiled in Concord, Massachusetts. Okay, so they're going to come, they're going to try to take away these arms, these, these guns. All right. Along the way, they were confronted by a small group of militia, all right, uh, um, on the Lexington Green, it was called. You want to write that down. That's where they fought, on the Lexington Green. It's just a, it's just a pasture area uh, um, uh, called the Lexington Green. The British actually um, kill ten Americans and then move on to the town of Concord. However, outside the town of Concord, these British military are going to be met by, at, um, by mil Minutemen at what's called the North Bridge. Uh, the North Bridge. All right. After a fight, the British have to retreat to Boston under continuous fire. Okay. Because these Minutemen do not back down. All right. Now later, long after the fact, when America has obviously won the Revolutionary War, Ralph Waldo Emerson will sit down and write Concord Hymn. Notice the subtitle, sung at the completion of the Battle Monument, July 4th, 1837. July 4th, 1837. Now, if July 4th, 1776 is the beginning of America as a country, right, then you could do some quick mathematics to see how much time has passed from 1776 to 1837, all right? Now we're going to look at the poem itself. Let's go ahead and turn to the text itself. Notice right away, jot down at 2B, how many stanzas. Notice each stanza has how many lines. Notice that there is some end rhyme as well, games being played here. Maybe we'll see this as we go, all right? Let's go ahead now and listen to a professional reader. All you do again, follow along, okay? Here we go. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm having a little t uh, problem with my technology. I'm a problem with my technology. I'll just read it for you guys. All right, let's go ahead and look at it together. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. Here once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world. The foe long since in silence slept, alike the conqueror silent sleeps. And time the ruined bridge has swept down the dark stream which seaward creeps. On this green bank, by this soft stream, we set today a votive stone that memory may their deed redeem when, like our sires, our sons are gone. Spirit that made those heroes dare to die and leave their children free, Bid time and nature gently spare the shaft we raise to them and thee. All right, let's execute, uh, um, exegete really quickly here now uh, this set of lines. Let's begin stanza by stanza. At level one, let's just write one, two, three, and four. The reason we'll do that is each stanza. And then let's just exegete really quickly each stanza. Notice the first one. By the rude bridge, rude here meaning rough, as your, as your footnote tells you, right? that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. What is an unfurled flag? It is a flag that is unrolled. It's blowing in the wind, in other words, right? Here once the embattled, notice they're not called militia. They're not even called fighters. They're called what? See, notice that's the reason this cat's not only holding a rifle, but he's also holding a plow, right? Notice 
that once uh, the embattled farmer stood and fired the shot heard round the world. This is a famous line from this poem. The shot heard round the world means what? Well, this was going to be a moment in history when a small group of people would stand up to the British Empire and in the process of doing this, of course, began the country that you now know of as your, your, your America, right? So in other words, this is a powerful way to say that what these guys were doing, they didn't know at the time it was going to be, had the significance that it would have, and yet it did. All right, let's look at the second stanza. The foe long since in silence sw uh, slept, of course, this is the British, right? Alike the conqueror, silent sleeps. Uh-oh, in other words, what does he say? By 1837, all of the people who fought in 1775, they're now gone, they're now silent, they're, they're, they're now dead, right? They're in graves, notice. And time, notice it's capitalized, do you see that? And time, the ruined bridge has swept down the dark stream which seaward creeps. In other words, this is everything's past, right? Everything is in the past, it's all, it's all over with. In other words, now, America is a dynamic, growing country, right? Look at the third stanza. On this green bank, by this soft stream, we set today a votive stone. Now, this votive is a word you want to write down in your, in your annotations. What does the word votive mean? Well, your footnote will tell you that it has to do with memory. In other words, if you want to remember something, you set up a stone and that rock or monument, statue, will be a way to remember it. So when you look at it, then you remember something important about it. Okay. Now, of course, we do the same thing, don't we? So, for example, if you walk into our high school hall, you will see, for example, trophies inside of cases. What are those trophies for? Well, they, that means the teams or the individual won something. Yeah, but why a trophy? Like, why don't they just give you a lollipop? That's funny. Sometimes students like, yeah, that's true. Like, why or why don't they just give you money? For example, if you win a championship in high school, why don't they give each person on the team $1,000 cash? Well, yeah, I've never thought about that. Like, why, why don't they get a, a gift certificate to go to a local restaurant? Right? See how that works? Or like when we were in small kids and we played sports, they give you what? A juice box and a fruit roll-up, right? So, for example, why don't you just get that? Why is it that a trophy, which rep... Ah, oh, it's about memory, isn't it? See, it's a votive. Votive, that's this word, votive, right? The votive stone. That memory made their deed redeemed. When like our sires, that is to say our fathers, our sons are gone. In other words, the argument is what? Put it in your notes. The whole notion is people do great things and then they die. And those great things can be remembered by the next generation because there is a monument. That's the whole idea. Okay. Spirit, last stanza. That made those, uh-oh, did you see what he calls them? And this will remind us a Longfellow psalm of life in this world's broad field of battle in the bivouac of life. Be not like dumb driven cattle. Be a, there's the H word again, right? Be a hero in the strife. Notice he calls them heroes and he said that they dared to die. Wow, that's an interesting line. They dared to die. In other words, Emerson is going to make the argument that people before us dared to die so that what? Well... Here again, he's making this argument. You don't have a country if these men and women don't dare to die and leave their children free. The idea, of course, is parents and the older generation have to make sacrifices so the younger generation can have opportunities. Of course, the reality is that the children can quickly forget what those sacrifices were. They kind of assume it's always been this way. It's always been like this. What's the big deal? Why is everyone making a big deal about this? You see what we're saying? All right. Notice he says, bid time and nature, capital T, capital N, gently spare the shaft we raise to them and thee. In other words, let's now make some 2A observations here. 
Let's write down at least one understanding or message from this poem about the need for monuments, the need to remember fallen heroes. Why is it so easy, do you think, to forget the sacrifices others have made? Let's also make the observation that Emerson, along with many others, is going to argue that this is the role of education. Schools are first and foremost about not only teaching us how to read, write, and do computations, but schools are the place where we are taught about the history that is going to be so influential, right, in giving us the country that we have. So in other words, it's a function of helping young people to learn to remember what's important. Let's talk really quickly to B. Notice again that we have, of course, here, notice, we have stanzas of four lines. Uh-oh, did you notice that there is some rhyme scheme? So for example, look in the first stanza. The, in, the last word of the first line, flood, right? Well, notice rhyme kind of with the word stood, but only as what we call sight rhyme. Notice unfurled, the last word of the second word line, rhymes with world, the last word of the, th of the fourth line. Notice next stanza, slept, wept, sleeps, creeps. Do you see that? Now, if we were wanting to designate this rhyme scheme, we would write little letter A after the first word flood, little, little letter B after the second word uh, unfurled, little letter A after the, after the third word stood, little letter B after the third word world. But because slept and none of the words in the first stanza rhyme, then we've got to go to a new. So this is C, D, C, D. And then we continue with E, F, E, F. And then, of course, the same project all over again. See how that works. Okay. Is there any rhythm here? So, for example, let's, te let's test it out really quickly. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. Ba -bum. Here once the embattled farmer stood and fired the shot heard round the world. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. It's what we call an iambic foot. Notice we got something very similar when we were studying that kind of rhythm, remember, of an earlier poem, right, in, in Longfellow's Song of Life. Okay, let's talk really quickly at 3A. Jot down, what is your favorite movie? When a small group of people have to fight against a large group of people and they either win or they don't win. What's your favorite movie in this regard? And all of a sudden, some of you will say, whoa, that's true in a lot of movies. Where you always have that underdog or the smaller group fighting against the larger group, the more dominant group, right? And the assumption is that they're going to lose, right? And then all of a sudden, they find some way to win. Okay. What's your favorite movie in that regard? Do you have a favorite um, TV show that works the same game? What about the question of monuments in stories? What is your favorite novel or story or movie where a monument is set up to try and help people remember stuff? It might be something very simple like putting a stack of rocks up. Or it might be something really bigger, like building a big statue or something like that. And finally, let's go to 3B. What is for you your favorite monument? We maybe have, are familiar with different monuments. Of course, we live out here in the West where, for example, some of you maybe see Mount Rushmore, a famous monument of four important presidents' faces on it. Some of you maybe are familiar in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. There are famous monuments all over the place. Some of you are maybe familiar with the monument that sits right outside of Cody, Wyoming, as you pull into town. That is the uh, celebration of the fallen of different wars maybe you're familiar with, right? Jot down for you, what is a monument in your town? Do we have one in our town? For example, right down there in the center of town, right, there is a little park where there is a woman standing, correct? You ever noticed what she's doing? Maybe the next time you drive by, you can take a look. She is uh, also side by side. There's a, a larger kind of sculpture there in metal of a plow 
All right, what's up with what's up with that? What are we commemorating in that square in our center of our town? Well, two things. One, we're commemorating that she is spreading seed, right? So in other words, she's growing things. And the other has to do with the creating of those canals. Of course, the importance of canals is so that you can grow. Because if you've ever flown into Worland from the air, you know that it's all desert. And then all of a sudden it's green. How did it get to be green? Well, people had to spend a lot of time being able to direct the water so that things could grow. Or you couldn't have a town like that, like that town. See how that works, right? Okay. Are there any monuments, I've already mentioned this, the, the trophy cases, are there any mon other monuments in our, in our school building? Some of you don't think of it this way, but you'll think of it different the next time that you look at the pictures that we call our senior pictures. When you walk past those, those are kind of a monument. Jot down how. How is that a monument? How is looking at those senior photographs a monument? And some of you maybe know people, right, who were there from long, long ago. And the really old ones are always fun to look at, right? Dude, what was up with their hair? You know, things like that. Of course, we never really think about the fact that there will come a point when people will look at you in one of those pictures. Once you graduate from high school, many, many years later, they will look at you. Maybe somebody who is related to you who will say, that isn't you. And you're going to say, yeah, it is. Well, then how come you look so different? And you'll have to explain, well, that was a long, long time ago. That's like 40 years ago when I graduated from high school. That isn't you. It doesn't even look like you. See how that works? Okay. So monuments are that way. Final question for 3B. In your life to this point, if you were to create a single monument for one moment in your life, what is for you the most important single thing you would want to have remembered? Okay. What is the single most important thing that you would want others to remember about you? It might be something that you've done. It might be something that you tried to do, right? So, for example, many of the men who died in Concord on that day, they didn't realize that they were sacrificing their life for a country that would later be built. What is for you the most famous thing that you've done? Have you done anything worthy of a monument? Or if last night you hadn't woken up, back to our earlier conversation with Emerson, and last night was it for you, what would they be saying about you today, the people who are closest to you? What would they say about you to remember you? Would they mention one or two things that you've done that's kind of important? Or that you tried to do, maybe, that was kind of important? Okay. All right, there you go, an introduction to uh, the poetry of Emerson.